Well, thank you and good evening. I'm Otto Othman. Now, Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim last week presented Budget 2024, which landed with a plump, bringing forth a whopping allocation of 393.8 billion ringgit, now the largest in Malaysia's history. Now, it has stirred a lot of reactions and comments by all Malaysians. Now, so live online right now, we have with us tonight the Chief Economist of Maybank Group, Mr. Suhaimi Ilyas, to provide us with some insights and also some thoughts on the matter. Now, thank you so much for being with us, uh, Mr. Suhaimi. Thanks for having me. So, Mr. Hassami, kicking off, what is your initial reaction after the budget was presented by the Prime Minister last Friday? Do you feel somewhat satisfied with the allocations announced? I think initially, um, budget 2024 uh, emphasizes sustainable growth, balanced development, as well as being equitable and inclusive for the people. There are two key takeaways in my opinion, uh, as an economist. One is the government remains committed to fiscal consolidation, a budget deficit as a percentage of uh, GDP and in value next year is uh, lower at 4.3% and 85 billion ringgit compared with 5% bill, 5 and 93 billion ringgit in 2023. And this is basically shows the government is committed to uh, be on track towards achieving a budget deficit to GDP ratio averaging 3.1% in 2025-2026, as well as the longer term aim of capping uh, our budget deficit to GDP ratio at 3%. The other thing I want to highlight, uh, Otto, is um, the allocations and incentives of budget 2024 are aligned to all those economic and policy blueprints, master plans, roadmaps that were announced in the past two to three months, i.e. Madani Economy, the 12th Malaysia Plan Midterm Review, the new Industrial Master Plan 2030, and the National Energy Transition Roadmap. So it's a budget that is obviously good for construction and infrastructure activities, but it's also positive for strategic high growth, high value industries and sectors like uh, green energy transition and mobility, electronics, chemicals, digital economy, startup, tourism, Islamic finance, halal industry, global services hub, as well as addressing issues of uh, food security. Now, how does the banking sector actually react to this kind of uh, information and uh, of course the budget? From the banking sector perspective, there are a few things to highlight as far as the budget is concerned. As mentioned earlier, one of the key strategic sector identified in Madani economy narrative and framework is Islamic finance and the budget 2024 tax incentives for Islamic securities buying and selling, for Labuan entities undertaking Islamic finance activities will enhance the breadth and depth of our Islamic finance product offerings and services. The other thing is budget 2024 also emphasizes the importance of sustainability, addressing climate change and building future resilience by prioritizing pathways to a just transition to net zero carbon emission via renewable energy, green technologies, as well as uh, environment and energy conservation. Budget initiative in this uh, area include financial institutions commitment uh, to 200 billion ringgit worth of financing. There one more thing that I want to mention here is micro, small, medium enterprises is also a priority for budget, especially in terms of enhancing the funding ecosystem for MSMEs transitions toward productivity, innovation, digitalization, and sustainability, including energy transition, as well as scaling up to be regional and global players. And this is reflected by the 44 billion worth of financing and guarantee schemes. Now, thank you very much for that explanation. Now, service tax increased to 8% uh, except for food and beverages, uh, telecommunications, parking, logistics, high value goods tax between uh, 5 to 10% and 10% of capital gain tax. How could these new taxes potentially contribute right, to Malaysia's revenue and how much could we expect from these? I think overall, 
those tech measures uh, you mentioned just now are expected to earn the government an extra four and a half billion ringgit on net basis after taking into account of revenue losses or foregone from the various tax incentives in budget 2024. Now, how would be mostly affected by these tax? Who would be? And uh, uh, how affected would they be, actually? Well, services tax hike, in my opinion, will mostly affect higher income groups as they have higher disposable income and therefore they spend more on services as opposed to lower income groups that spend more of their incomes on essentials like housing, food, transport, clothing, energy, including fuel. In addition, um, as we understand currently, and as you mentioned, uh, the services tax hikes to 8% from 6% will not affect services like FNB, telecommunications and parking uh, charges. So the rest will only see 2 percentage point increase in the services tax charges. I think the one that will be most affected sector-wise or business-wise is those that are going to be included as a result of the expansion of services tax uh, coverage uh, on services like karaoke centers, delivery of goods, and non-financial brokerage and underwriting services like for ships, aircraft, commodities, and real estates. Now, what about the proposed implementation of a global minimum tax? Would it pose any challenge to any foreign company with at least 750 million euros in revenue to invest in Malaysia? Well, a bit of background. I mean, global minimum tax is a global tax initiative to end the race to the bottom in terms of competition between countries on tax rates and incentives that led to the operational and profit shifting by MNCs to avoid or reduce paying taxes. So GMT is aimed at ensuring MNCs pay the right or fair amount of taxes, regardless of where they operate and the agreed tax rate is 15%. So far, more than 140 countries have agreed to adopt and implement GMT. And to recall, Ministry of Finance has indicated uh, Malaysia's commitment on this last year and the original plan was to implement GMT next year but that is now pushed to 2025. Our neighbouring countries like Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam will also implement GMT. So I think there is no reason for us not to implement GMT on foreign-based MNCs in Malaysia because other countries will tax Malaysian MNCs abroad. I think in terms of implication to you know foreign companies or foreign direct investors, I, I believe they look at a host of factors, not just tax regime alone, when making decision on where to invest because it is a long-term commitment. So this includes quality of our infrastructure and our workforce, the rules of law, regulatory efficiency, geographical locations, protection of rights and intellectual properties, political stability even. So we should therefore focus on our attractiveness as an investment destination or location or as a total package. And that's what was said in the narratives of Madani Economy and NIMP 2030. That's what needs to be done and I believe that's what's being done. Now, other than generating revenue, what else do you think is, uh, are we missing out on this? Um, I don't really see it as uh, missing out uh, in terms of uh, generating revenues because I suppose your, your question relates to the issue of this target to achieve uh, medium-term fiscal consolidation. If we look from budget 2024, the fiscal consolidation strategies and measures are broad based with four key elements. One is the tax measures that we have discussed so far to boost government income. We have that fights in existing taxes like services tax and sugar tax. We have introduction of new taxes like capital gains tax, high value luxury goods tax next year and global minimum tax in 2025. Uh, second set of measures is actually spending measures and the focus is on targeted subsidy rationalization. Third set of measures is administrative measures and the key one is the rollout of e-invoicing system over the next two years, essentially to enhance tax efficiency, 
audit and compliance and hence improve tax collection. The fourth element in our strategy uh, for medium term fiscal consolidation is legislative measures to strengthen uh, fiscal prudence and discipline in public finance. So we have a uh, fiscal responsibility act that was stable and approved last week. And I expect the government to follow up with the government procurement act in second quarter next year, essentially to improve uh, governance in public spending and contracts, especially in, in open tenders, as well as compulsory audit and accountability in large value procurements and contracts. That's great. Now, how would foreign investors actually react to these announcements? What uh, would they say or still see Malaysia as a business friendly nation? Would they? I think they do. Um, I think what is very clear since 2021, uh, i.e. post the pandemic years of 2020, if we look at the statistics uh, from MIDA under MITI on approved investment, uh, foreign direct investment into Malaysia has been very, very robust. That continued last year. And in the first half of this year, the trend continued to indicate that uh, MIDA should be able to meet its target of achieving uh, approved investment of 200 billion ringgit. And I guess uh, you, you will also, we have also seen in terms of news flows uh, recently, there has been some uh, interesting high profile uh, foreign direct investment uh, coming into Malaysia involving companies like Tesla, Infineon and, and the likes. I guess, as I said, uh, the challenge or the, the focus uh, going forward is to continue uh, focusing on uh, boosting our attractiveness as an investment destination and location as a total package. Now, the government aims to reach a 3.5% deficit to GDP ratio within the next two years. Now, is this actually possible? And how can Malaysia actually achieve this? Um, I think if you look at what has been happening uh, over the past uh, three to four years, we are on the right track. Uh, in 2020 to 2022, our fiscal or budget deficit to GDP ratio average is 6%. Uh, it come down to 5.6% in 2022. Uh, drop further to estimated 5% this year. Next year, expected to be 4.3%. So we are, in my opinion, on track uh, to achieve that fiscal consolidation. Uh, Measures-wise, as I mentioned earlier, uh, government uh, strategy for fiscal consolidation and measures are broad-based with those four key elements that I've mentioned in terms of uh, tax measures, spending measures, administrative measures, and legislative measures. Of course, uh, one more key element that is very important is we must have economic growth because this will help support and improve government finance. And that's why Budget 2024 is also about stimulating longer term sustainable economic growth, given the allocation and incentives for those strategic high value, high growth sectors, industries, activities that I mentioned earlier. Now, assuming all of the proposed plans went well, what does it mean to the people of Malaysia? Well, Budget 2024 marks the start of the country's long-term journey to economic restructuring uh, and reforms. If all goes well, ultimately, Rakyat will benefit from essentially higher income because among the key targets and aims of the economic and policy blueprints, master plans and roadmaps over the past two, three months, is to raise the GDP share of workers' income to 40% in 2025 and 45% in 10 years' time from around one-third currently. The NIMP 2030 also aims to raise the median wages and salaries in manufacturing sector to around 4,500 ringgit uh, in 2030 from 2,500 ringgit currently. So I think ultimately the biggest benefit to the people, if all goes well, is higher income. Now, is there anything the Rakyat actually can do to help? Well, in terms of how people can help, I think there is a need to realize and accept that certain things that have been part of our lives for so long are no longer sustainable and cannot go on forever, namely blanket subsidies. 
The other thing is we need to raise our productivity as well to justify higher income. So people should take advantage of budget 2024 measures like the individual income tax relief for fees on upskilling and self-enhancement courses to improve skill set and their work knowledge. Now, I'm afraid that uh, that's all the time that we have. But before we go, I just want to add that uh, it seems that manufacturing seems to be the key engine of growth for Malaysia. According to the new Industrial Master Plan 2030, uh, more than 20% contribution to our GDP with a window of about seven years. Uh, are we really ready for such ambitious economical undertaking, do you think? Well, I think um, quite clearly the target set under the various uh, master plans, roadmaps and blueprints is certainly uh, looks ambitious and I would call and I, or I would say some of the targets can be considered as stretch targets. But I guess uh, the reason why we put all those ambitious target stretch KPIs, so to speak, is essentially to galvanize all parties concerned. Uh, to basically work hard, work together uh, to achieve and realize those uh, aims and targets. And I think as far as manufacturing is concerned, the reason why uh, MITI uh, come up with NIMP 2030 is to make sure that our manufacturing sector, our manufacturing industries, our manufacturing economy does not hollow out uh, because that is the risk that can happen uh, to any economy. Uh, we have done well in terms of restructuring and transforming our economy from one that is commodity-based to one that is industries-based. Uh, going forward, we want to make sure that the industry base uh, remains intact and more importantly, they move up and uh, shift to produce high-value, high-growth, complex uh, products that will also entail benefits to the people in terms of generating uh, high paying jobs uh, and high income. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Swami, for uh, that uh, information and uh, your time as well. So I'm afraid that's all the time that we have um, we have for today, actually. So thank you so much once again uh, for your knowledge and insights. So it's back to you.